This anime starts with a loser, very fat, who has a gentle shit fever inside his body and also on the outside. Because of this, he suffers bullying all the time, and even after he ends up going to another world, he remains a pathetic loser. And during the hunger, he never ceased to feel. He went there and stole a fruit, which made him rise from level, as if he was using a hack, making him very powerful and making him get pretty slim and pretty, causing him to attract various kinds of girls and creatures. It all starts with our protagonist at school, being intimidated by his classmates. God, acting like a teacher in a classroom, told everyone to form groups and make sure they stay together well because they will all be transported to another world, and there they will be heroes. God gives each student a different skill and the ability to read the status of others, and when the status of our protagonist was checked by a classmate, everyone started laughing at him because the guy has the same statistics as an ant. This caused everyone who no longer liked him to prevent him from joining his group, so every Everyone, with the exception of our protagonist, was transported to another world. Yeah, our fucking fat guy's been left behind. And jail, he's fat. He's really fat. God, realizing that our protagonist was left behind, seeing that he was an undesirable person and a real loser, went there and decided to give our protagonist an extra special ability. And instead of releasing him and letting him live his normal, sad, depressed, fat and fat life, he went there and sent him alone to the other world. And unlike all his friends, our protagonist ended up going to a forest. Now, I don't know if God helped him or if God did in the spoil. And after spending five days in that forest, our protagonist's hunger began to increase more and more. And he obviously only stayed alive because of the fat that his body had. But that didn't stop him from feeling hungry. And in the middle of despair, he tried to eat a worm he saw crashing on the ground. But before our fat hero managed to catch the worm, Something jumped out of the bushes and stepped on it. And when he was lying on the floor, our front saw a fruit and immediately picked it up. He evaluated it and discovered that it was the so-called fruit of evolution, but he had no other information about that fruit. Hungry, he quickly ate the fruit with an awful flavor. And by the name of the fruit being the fruit of evolution, he thought it would get strong or something. And after eating, he heard a voice asking him to activate the fruit. Frightened, he spoke for the fruit to be activated but nothing happened, so he got up and went looking for more food. Further forward, he encountered a group of monkeys, and when he checked his statistics, he found that these monkeys were of level 120, having a higher KI than his own. Literally, a monkey with a high KI. Without knowing what to do and hungry, our protagonist wanted to eat a mushroom he had found, but he did not have enough information about what that mushrooms did. However, the idiot still ate it, and immediately he fell to the ground, full of pain and representing the entire population of the fat when he was about to die, he decided to die by eating, being the hero of all the fat. So he ate the rest of the fruit of evolution he had and immediately felt better. He also acquired resistance to poison and his classification increased. But before he could celebrate his level rise, he was attacked by an intelligent monkey. He managed to hurt him and because of that damage, he immediately drank one of the recovery potions he stole. Having done so, Seiji got up and tried to challenge the monkey, but as the monk was too strong, our protagonist was once again beaten. Fortunately, before the monkey could eat it, he smelled it under our hero's arm and ended up dying. Yes, prison. Our protagonist has a skill there that God did not give, which is his Fedor, capable of killing even an animal. After dying, the monkey turned into items, and our protagonist, by picking up these items, acquired new skills. Among the items, there was a book about intelligent monkeys, and Seiji was surprised to be able to read the text. It was then that he realized that the special skill God gave him, in reality, was the ability to read things. And from nowhere, a voice informed him that evolution was beginning. Seiji had no idea what was going on, and he just started to feel a lot of pain. And when the pain diminished, he got up and realized that he wasn't fat anymore, and that his statistics had increased a lot. And soon afterwards, he discovered that his evolution had not yet been completed, and that he would still go through the same pain at least nine times. To make things worse, even having killed a level 120 monkey, he was still at level 1. Five months have passed with our protagonist in the woods, and since then he has 
managed to use the knowledge he has gained from the intelligent monkey to survive, even to defeat a macro smell of level 311 and acquiring new skills, in addition to a legendary water spirits pawn. And apparently, for every monster he defeats, he wins a book with the knowledge of the monster, and so did Crew. By looking at the book of that monster, he discovered a hidden spot on a map, which made him remember that he saw the same thing in the intelligent monkey book. So he then decided to take a hole there to see what it was. At that moment, he immediately went through another evolution. And when it was over, he wondered what would happen when he passed through the final evolution. And as he lay down thinking about the final evolution, he quickly realized that he was surrounded by more intelligent monkeys. Before he could react, a big ugly red gorilla appeared. And look, he has a pink flower on his head. Very cute. And that gorilla wants our protagonist to fight him. And even though he got stronger, our protagonist is still a big fearful coward. So he asked the gorilla if he could refuse the battle, but the gorilla replied that he could come to fight and that the other intelligent monkeys would not interfere in the fight. Even so, Saint was afraid for his life. After all, this gorilla is at level 700. Yeah, jail. It's sad. To make things worse, the gorilla has already come to the punch. Our protagonist even managed to escape, but he was overwhelmed by the strength of that blow. The Saint also noticed that the gorilla is casting loving looks at him, and apparently this gorilla likes strong people a lot. And that's when our protagonist realized that, in fact, this gorilla is a female, and realizing that he won the heart of a gorilla made Saint feel angry. In response to all this love, he used a sharp attack, from which the gorilla managed to evade easily, and the heavy duel kicked him. Unfortunately, the Saint did not deviate from this blow and was thrown flying through the forest. The gorilla was very impressed with the fact that her quick fist didn't kill this human, and so she wanted to go even further, having this human exactly the type she likes. However, Saint made it clear that he was not interested in having a romance with the gorilla. But even so, the gorilla presented herself as Saria while trying to act nicely and timidly. Our protagonist asked why a ugly gorilla had the name of a pretty girl, and all the gorilla Saria heard was that she was very pretty. Still angry with everything that was happening, the saint used the inflexible tail skill he had received from Akrolf to attack her, but she used the pulse of the air and fell on him like a bomb. The saint escaped, and he hoped that the gorilla would have killed herself by doing so, but she rose up and expressed her joy that he had managed to escape his attack. The saint then used the water spirit's barrel to enlarge his water magic by raising his hand over his head. He used a skill called Fall Disaster, which would release a lot of water on his opponent. However, as he is more dumb than a monkey, he did not direct his water to Saria and was hit by his own attack. Wet, he tried to cover up his own stupidity by acting calmly and saying that Saria was very good at fighting. However, she immediately told him that she had nothing to do with what had happened. After all, she is a gorilla with 200 kai, and our protagonist was embarrassed by the fact that a gorilla drew his attention for his folly. To make things worse, the gorilla didn't give him time to recover, and she used her flash fist to give him a kick. The old fat man's life passed before his eyes. As a last resort, he released his skill called Malchir. However, instead of killing her, as had happened to another clever monkey, Saria declared her love for him and asked him to marry him. At Saria's house, Saichi demanded that she let him go, but Saria told him that he was her husband and that he would have to stay with her. In response, Saichi said that she is a gorilla and he is a human, so there was no way they could marry, and instead of the gorilla responding, she told him to eat, and when he gave a bite, he was surprised with a delicious food. Besides the food, Saria revealed that she had made new clothes for him, and seeing all this happening in front of his eyes, Saichi was about to go mad. After after all, a gorilla was a great wife. Still covered in doubts, he asked her how she could speak, and she told him that she had found some books in a cave and read them. She showed him the books, and by reading them, he immediately acquired skill. While watching Saria fishing, Seiichi planned his escape, but before he could go far, he faced a giant spider and shouted like a girl in danger. Saria immediately came to her rescue and gave her a blow, making her fly in the sky. She asked our protagonist that he was quite shaken with everything if he was okay, and our protagonists were no longer so afraid of the gorilla. He was even thinking of himself as a superficial idiot for judging the gorilla by appearance. Yeah, the guy's starting to be conquered by the gorilla. While eating, Saria told Seiichi that she and the intelligent monkeys would go out to collect the fruit of evolution. She asked him if he knew exactly what it was, and he said no, despite having stolen several fruits that she had previously collected. So Saria said if he eats ten of these fruits, he'll get very strong. However, if the person eats
eats 11, he dies. She also mentioned that she herself had already eaten 10 and that someone had stolen the only fruit she had kept to give to her future husband. Seiichi was frightened when she said that she would kill the thief who stole them, so he immediately begged for his life, admitting that it was he who had stolen them. She forgave him, but said that since he had eaten, they would have to marry. Hearing this, Seiichi made an expression of denial, and Saria asked if he hated him, and he said no. Having said that, she appeared dressed as a bride and began begging him to marry her. After that, Saria went out to hunt, and Seiichi took the opportunity to escape. Meanwhile, at another location, Seiichi's classmates are training. Basically, by arriving in this world, all those who did not want to form groups with Seiichi were assigned to defeat the Lord of Demons, and since then, they have been working only on that. Back in the woods, Seiichi was fleeing from Saria. When she found out he had disappeared, she began to look for him. Our protagonist already arrived in a cave with an intimidating aura, but he ran inside when he heard a few screams. Inside the cave, he opened a door and found a room where he saw a skeleton with a red light coming out of his eyes. The skeleton was sitting on his throne. When he saw it, the skeleton was impressed by the fact that he was able to get to his room and believed that our protagonist was strong enough to be able to do that. Seiichi, on the other hand, saw this skeleton as a dangerous being and decided to check his statistics. Thus, he discovered that this skeleton is the Dark Lord and that he is at level 1. Even having titled himself scary by his enemy being at level 1, Seiichi ended up getting relieved after all. If he is at level 1, he can face him. However, the skeleton told him to look again at what Seiichi did, and quickly he discovered that that thing in front of him was at level 1500. After showing his level, he told our protagonist that he thought the first person to enter his room would be a very strong person, but instead, a loser with a smell of ass appeared and tried to stab Seiichi, but Saria came in the way and was stabbed in his place. Seeing the gorilla going from base, Seiichi called by her name, which made her very happy to be called by his name for the first time since they met, and he tried to give her recovery potions, but she said it was no use, as she was already dead. She also explained to our protagonist that she was only able to speak because of a skill that keeps her active for a while. Seiichi used the gorilla's last moments to apologize for the way he was treated, but she told him not to call and asked him to smile as her last request. Meanwhile, the Cavarana was watching their farewell emotionally and found it all ridiculous. In exposition, Seiichi ordered him to shut his mouth because he does not understand the true love between a human and a gorilla. And now, without where to run and with a lot of anger, our protagonist has finally decided to face someone really instead of thinking about running. He attacked the enemy, who easily blocked his attacks. And as he attacked his enemy, the Seiichi was telling him how Saria had been a wonderful wife. The enemy was surprised at Seiichi's feelings and asked if he really felt anything for a gorilla. And Seiichi declared that he loved Saria. So this time, using his brain, Seiichi used that attack out of the water and directed a whole stream of water to the cranium, which used a skill called the black hole to capture the water. He told Seiichi to give up. After all, a fractal like him will never be able to defeat her. However, he refused, claiming that he had not accepted Saria's feelings for him. So, motivated by the great love he felt for Saria and using his ability to move instantly, he managed to surprise his enemy and stab him. She accepted her defeat and thanked Seiichi for showing him true love. But before he disappeared, Seiichi saw a young woman show up and hug him. As they hugged each other, he told her that he would protect her this time. After that, Seiichi saw them disappear and soon remembered Saria and ran to her. She also began to disappear, but he kissed her just before she disappeared. In this, a bright light appeared. In the place where Saria was before, there was a beautiful girl with red hair, with a pink flower in her hair. Seiichi was surprised by all this, and to improve the weather, the girl rose up and ran to hug him, which caused him to have a nasal bleeding. And when Seiichi realized that this girl was Saria, he was quite shocked. After all these events, our protagonist read the story of the Kaviroska and discovered that the enemy he just defeated was a noble man 1,500 years ago. But he was betrayed by his wife and by the emperor, and the only person who supported him was his maid, who loved him very much. But she died, and he could sacrifice himself to save him. After her death, he became a vengeful monster and spent his days alone in the cave. Moved by their story, Seiichi told Saria that he was happy to have managed to reunite the two again. And after all this thrill, the final evolution of Seiichi began. And when the final evolution ended, it became even more beautiful.
beautiful, but still very ugly compared to Sweet Fox. After all this, our protagonist told Saria that he would like to leave the forest, and she said that she would go anywhere with him. In this, a little sheep appeared and presented herself as the administrator of the dungeon. She said she had come because they were the first to clean the basement, and Seiichi said she was a little late, so she admitted that she was late because she was enjoying Seiichi's suffering as they went through her final evolution. Then she gave Seiichi the rewards for getting out of the dungeon, which were some evolutionary fruits to cultivate, and a 10-day journey set. She also gave Saria a dress and Seiichi a helmet before transporting them out of the forest. So they had everything they needed to start their journey somewhere, so Seiichi told Saria that they should go to the nearest city. And if you register in the Guild of Adventurers and in the middle of the way they find a slime of level 88, and the site defeated this monster very easily. And that's how he realized that he had become a very strong guy. Among the items that this little monster dropped was a pair of boots and also some skill cards that allowed him to climb level, and this time, his level climb. Saint wasn't very happy because he was feeling that he was becoming a monster, and he didn't want to accidentally kill someone with a single blow. At that moment, he took off his helmet, and the item turned into a tunic, and Sari handed him a ticket, explaining why the helmet has changed. Basically, an item that was to hide a face evolved, and now became a mantle that will hide its true strength from others. At the entrance of the first city, the site lied, saying that they had lost their identities, so the guard asked them to touch the gem of truth to determine their criminal status, so let them enter the city. As soon as they did, he let them pass and warned them to take care of the guild. He then presented himself as Cloud and asked them to look for him if they needed help. Even after the Cloud user ID warning started targeting to a guild, thinking that probably the guy was exaggerating with his warning, but as soon as he opened the door, he saw a blonde woman recording an American American Pie movie that will be released in 2024. He immediately closed the door because he couldn't believe what he had just seen, and when he opened it again, this time she was pouring wax. For depilation on a man, and looking around, he saw more strange people, and soon realized that it was Batman's birthday, and quickly told Sarah that they should leave. However, before they could leave, they were stopped by the guild master who was wearing only what was important. He presented himself as a gangster, and in the next thought, that guy was was a head of wind that only wanted to know of staying showing his muscles. The man then flexed his muscles on their faces and strategically pushed them into the building. Inside, he drew the attention of the blonde woman, who immediately changed her clothes and presented herself as Iris and the receptionist. She told him the guild was gathering information from everybody and that if they signed up to the guilt, they would have access to this information. Seeing all this cozy atmosphere, the show said it all reminded of your home and told the site that it would be a good idea to join that guild. As soon as they finished recording, three guys wearing Moiken came in and asked the Switch to come with him. They took me to the back of the building, and when our protagonist took off his mantle, they were impressed with the beauty of the site, and at that moment our protagonist was caught by surprise. He thought he was going to fight the guys, but the guys began to take off their clothes in front of him, and all this was just a welcome party for them. Those men didn't want to fall into the shit, they wanted something else, so he ran away way to protect the virginity of his discharge pipe, but the guys went after him. They tried to convince him that he would love the experience, but he didn't listen and ran faster. After that, the site managed to return to the guild, and Ghastly said he was surprised that he was able to come back alive to them too. He said that the site was the first person to come back to life. To make things worse, before they can actually enter the guild, they need to go through some tests, and Ghastly explained that they need at least someone of rank B to be able to oversee the two, and so they presented the story, which in the case is a very strong adventurer, but with a bad luck. And since the site was just focused on her big plot, he didn't hear a word of what she said, so Sarah had to draw her attention. Arthuria was not satisfied with the idea of overseeing them, and when she complained, Ghastly told her that the site survived those Moiken guys, so he could survive her. After hearing this, she finally accepted and apologized for her rude behavior. So, when they were going for the first test, Artoria told Told them that they would start with a simple job. The first thing they were supposed to do was help in an orphanage, and Sarah
Sarah offered to do that, and while they were on their way to the second job, Artoria helped a child who had been injured. While she was taking care of her wounded leg, the rope that grabbed some wooden boards was loosened. Syed even tried to reach them, but the board fell on them, and getting closer, he saw that Artoria had managed to melt an object using his defensive ability, and the second mission now was to demolish a building. While Artoria tried to explain how they would do the work, Syed entered the building, and forgetting that he is very powerful, he pushed a single brick, causing the whole house to fall on him. Artoria was worried, thinking that our protagonist had been hurt, and she ran to look for him. While she was looking for him, she blamed herself for what had happened, because everyone around her was always hurting herself, and that is why she was called Artoria of Calamity. While she was crying, Syed came out under the rubble, and as soon as she saw him, she called him a brainless idiot, and the king arrested him for acting carelessly. She told him that as an adventurer, he needed to be able to feel the danger and be careful, saying that his stupidity would cost the life of his crew. Syed then apologized, and they went on to the next mission, and while Syed's classmates were training, the instructor watched them from a balcony with another knight. She told the knight that she was against sending them to fight against the Devil Lord, because the war has nothing to do with them. She also admitted that she was totally against the war against the demons and said that she would do everything she could to protect him. And back to the village, Artoria informed Saeed that the final task was to walk with the dog. Saeed thought that trick would be dirty until he saw that the dog was actually a wolf. The wolf chased him through the garden while his owner and Artoria watched him. Seeing Artoria very happy, the guy went there and said that she was happy for Saeed's sake, but she immediately denied it, although his face was red with the start of a nuclear explosion. After the mission was completed, they returned to the Gussler's Guild and took their reward, which in the case were swimwear. Yeah, they received it as if it was the most natural thing to receive as a prize. After that, Ares asked if they had a place to stay, but they said no, so Artoria said they could stay in the hostel where she is staying. Seeing this, Ares and Gussler were surprised. After all, it wasn't her habit to do something like that. Shamed, she even thought of withdrawing that offer. However, Sight and Sarah had already agreed, and after all this, Sight, Sarah, Sarah and Artoria went to a field to do another test. There, Artoria explained that all they needed to do was collect ten medicinal herbs. However, our protagonist immediately stood not hearing everything she had to say, and Artoria only smiled when she saw Sarah following him. A while later, Sarah handed over the herbs she had gathered, but when it was Syed's turn, he delivered several special mushrooms. Artoria asked him where the herbs she asked were, and he said he hadn't seen any, which made Artoria call him a donkey and say that he had never seen anyone so dumb as him. After all, the medicinal herbs they're collecting are quite easy to find, and it even has a good side on his foot. He took them and gave them to her, but she said that's not enough, and once again he ran into the woods to get something that was right in front of him, but the dirty one couldn't find, and while wondering why he could only find rare herbs, he heard some people talking, but as he doesn't even know how to take care of his own life, he decided to get into the lives of others and went to see who those people were. From afar, he could not hear what they were talking about, so he decided to ask them if they knew if he could find the herbs he was looking for. In doing so, he discovered that the two were demons, under the command of the captain of the third division of the army of the Lord of Demons. In discovering all this, Sate only considered a bunch of strangers and tried to step in, but they prevented him because they did not want Sate to spoil their plan since he saw them, and probably he must have heard their plan. And the action started with a ugly troll using his giant clove to hit Sate, but he stopped the guy's clove, using its ability to absorb and transfer the force of his opponents to him. Frightened, the cowardly demons fled, so Sate had no choice but to return to Artoria with the rare herbs he found. In the end, Artoria ended up dealing with the rare herbs she had, as he was looking very sad. And back in the Kingdom of Demons, the demons were being questioned why they fled a human, so they admitted that they had gone to the human kingdom to Mount Tel teleporting traps to thus reduce the human army before the fight actually began. Their leader asked where the traps would send the humans, and they said that the trap would take humans to the Black Dragon God's breakfast, and their commander said that 
that she felt bad about humans being caught in that trap. Their plan was quite interesting, however. They still need to be punished for their disobedience. Meanwhile, in the human realm, while waiting for Artoria to begin their last test, Artoria and Asaria met Cloud, and seeing how Sayet and Asaria were doing very well with Artoria, the guy went there and asked that they continue to be kind to Artoria, even after all the tests had been completed. And soon afterwards, Artoria joined them, asking if they already knew each other, and Cloud just answered her, saying that she had met good people. He then asked if that was the final test, and on receiving the yes answer, he wished them good luck before leaving. The final test was to defeat ten slimes, so Artoria asked Asaria what weapon she would use, and she said her fists were enough. Artoria was not convinced, and said that only watch what was happening. The test started, and when Say It was about to cut a goose, she disappeared. Artoria took a look at the area and realized that there were teletransport spells installed all over the area, so she told them the test should wait and instructed them to go back to town. However, accidentally, she stumbled into one of those traps. In that moment, Sate and Asaria quickly grabbed her and the three were teleported to the dungeon. The dragon felt their presence immediately and quickly became furious, and as he had no idea where they were or how to get back, Artoria suggested that they do the basic thing, which is to find a way out. Then she asked why they had been so persecuted and reproached them for neglecting the use of their brains. In response, Sate told her that her body reacted before he could think, and Asaria said she wanted to help her. Shaken by their determination, Artoria forgave them and handed a guide stone to Sate. She said that this stone had several legal functions, such as if a person gets in danger, it will shine red and it will guide you to that person at danger. And as soon as Artoria told them to stay together and not separate, she accidentally stepped into a trap and separated from them. And when she tried to call them, it turned out to be a useless act because they couldn't hear her. Now, the only solution is to find another way to join them. On the other side of the wall, Sate was scared. After all, they lost Artoria, and he even tried to use his fists to defeat the wall, thinking it was Saitama, but did well not. So Asaria, who has more intelligence than Sayet, showed he gave him the guide stone and said that they could use it to scrape Artoria. But unfortunately, none of them knew how to make the stone work. The only thing they did was ask the stone to indicate the way, and as incredible as it may seem, the rock began to move, flying towards the stony wall, indicating the place where the person was. And since they're kind of like a maze, they'll have to find the right way to get to Artoria. Meanwhile, the white-haired girl was fighting a mummy, who threw her against the wall very hard, causing her to cough blood. But she managed to get up and cut the mummy in two. With the mummy defeated, Artoria sat exhausted on a couch, and her greatest wish was that Sayit and Asaria were well. Meanwhile, Sayit and Asaria continued to enter into no exit alleys, and shortly before he lost his mind, Asaria called him into a room where he had found a large treasure chest. At that moment, Sayit did the cleverest thing he'd ever done since he entered that basement, that he went away. And when Asaria asked why, he said that the safe looked very suspicious. As they talked, the vault went there and demanded that they open it. And because they did nothing, the vault created members and tried to attack them. And in response, Sayit used his aquatic ability to attack him. So the trunk disappeared, and Sayit rose again. At that moment, a box of mysterious items appeared in front of them, and inside them, they found a book about the treasure box. And by reading the book, they learned that the object box's intention was only to interact with humans again. Thanks to this great desire, the treasure chest was able to develop limbs and even speak, even acquiring the ability to use magic. However, this only caused humans to see him as a monster. Desperate and alone, the treasure chest could only wander by places he had good memories. Yeah, the trunk had the saddest lore of the anime, and picking up the items that that trunk drugged, they found a a rare item known as the unfortunate ring, and after evaluating it, Siet learned that this multiplied a person's luck by at least two, and this is a pretty interesting item, which solves a certain person's bad luck problem. After that, that stone that Artoria gave them began to shine a red color, and on the other side of the screen, there was Artoria, exhausted, wearing her shaft as a beam, as she walked, not knowing that she was going towards the room where the great dragon was housed. She pushed a certain door and entered it, and there she felt a great present before she saw a Greek dragon, and he asked it if she had gone there to be his food. The dragon used some sort of wind magic to push her back, and as she is not a person to retreat in the face of danger, she gave away to move again and 
and left to attack the dragon. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of Demons, those soldiers who were using these teleporting spells to create traps had just received their punishment, and the person who punished them was asking them to stop without crying because she had done nothing serious to them. She asserted to all of them that the Black Dragon God was much worse, and that he was known as the strongest dragon in the army of the Lord of Demons, and finding him meant having the worst luck. And returning to our protagonist and Saria, they were observing the Shining Stone, and at that moment, our protagonist's brains gave a little beating, and he remembered the warning about the change of color. In summary, he realized that Artoria was in danger, and the stone was flying towards the wall. Desperate, Seiichi struck the wall, and this time he managed to break, even hurting his hands. On the other side of the screen, in the dragon's room, Artoria was being mistreated, but she wasn't ready to give up because she wanted to make sure Seiichi and Saria could get out illegally, so she used everything she had, using even her berserker skill to attack the dragon, but that didn't even bother her enemy. In the end, to kill her, he simply used his HA to hit her as if she were a fly, and although he hit, she returned with full force, but before he could approach, he fired thorns from his tail, which stuck her to the wall. At this point in the story, Artoria was already being completely consumed by her ability that she activated, so she did not let her down and tried to attack him again. This time, he stabbed her with his thorns and admitted that she had surprised him. He threw her to the ground, and while she was lying down, she murmured an apology to Seiichi and Saria because she believed she had failed with them by not defeating the dragon. She accepted her fate, closed her eyes, and when the dragon was about to finish, she heard his name, and at opening her eyes, she saw Seiichi using his mantle as a shield against the dragon's fire, and smiling, he told her that they had come to rescue him. Artoria asked Seiichi and Saria how they had found it, and Saria explained that the stone began to shine red, and knowing that she was in danger, Seiichi entered Superman mode and went out demolishing the walls, opening way, and so that they could reach it with E. She then asked about the dragon, and Seiichi, pointing at his fallen figure, went there and said that they accidentally hit him by entering that place. In this, the black dragon woke up more angry than before, because he was being disturbed there by dirty humans. He told them all that they would die in their hands, but Seiichi said he had no intention of losing to a giant cockroach. The black dragon used his conquering sticks to throw a fireball at Seiichi, who managed to block the attack with his swords but was pushed backwards. In this, Seiichi used his advanced variation and discovered that the dragon was much stronger than him. Being at level 5000, continuing with the fight, he managed to evade and be hit by the dragon's tail using his instantaneous movements. However, the dragon grabbed with spell and used his tail to throw Seiichi to a wall. And while suffering in battle, Seiichi wondered why his power absorption skills weren't working. To make things worse, the dragon went there and released his supreme ability, called Infernal Hell. Now Seiichi was sure that this time, he and Asaria would be burned to death. So Asaria went there and drew his attention, telling him to use the skill he used when he fought against her. So he used his water spirit's talk to dive a water disaster, completely draining everybody with water. At this point in the battle, the dragon was completely angry and said that he would not lose to another useless human. Then he threw a fireball at Seiichi, which escaped again. But again, he was caught on the spot because of the spell. Then the dragon prepared to strike his final blow, but Seiichi managed to move his body and also acquired a skill called resistance to intimidation. And then he attacked the dragon, who was very surprised that this human had been able to free himself. But before he could react to it, Seiichi cut him perfectly. The dragon couldn't believe he had lost to another human, and lamented his failure before disappearing, leaving behind a box of items. While Seiichi wondered why the black dragon hated humans so much, he rose from level, and Asaria, excited, dropped him to the ground. He asked how Arthur was, and she said that the recovery potions had put her to sleep and that she would be fine when she woke up. Relieved by her being okay, Seiichi wanted to go home, but Asaria asked if he knew the way out of the basement, and he said they could check the item box for something that could help them. So, as Seiichi was playing the items, he was acquiring new abilities, and he realized that if he started to such the gem of God that he picked up, his statistics would increase, and his magical power too. In the item box, he also found a long black coat, which was much better than an old coat that was burned by the dragon. And the last item in the item box was the biography of the black dragon. With this, they discovered that he was once a guardian deity of humans, but home 
Romans became greedy and wanted to make powerful weapons with Black Dragon materials, and so they planned to defeat him. At the time, who saved him from Humans was Lord Demon, but he was defeated by the heroes who were the Humans called. With the Lord of Demons dead, they sealed the Black Dragon in his basement, and he promised to avenge mankind. After reading his story, Seichi filled himself, and later told Sarah that Lord Sheep had not appeared this time, even though they had come out of a dungeon. And as Seichi was about to answer, a smoke bomb exploded on his face, leaving him with an afrotope hairstyle, and now a letter fell on the floor, and Sarah grabbed it. In the letter, Seichi was congratulated for having generated another dungeon, while slowly becoming a heartless monster. In the letter, it was also explained that despite having come out of the dungeon, that Seichi could have kept the dragon alive there, so that he could live peacefully with the Lord of Demons. And now that he killed him, you know, he's gonna have to fight the devil. Finally, in the letter, Seichi was praised, and was somewhat ordered to continue with that good work, cleaning more dungeons. But the little bitch also said that Seichi should really stop doing that, which made our Pruta scream in frustration without understanding anything. After that, they returned to normal life, with Arthur still unconscious, and as they walked towards the city gate, she woke up and demanded that he put her on the floor as she argued to get out of her arms. Sarah told him to be careful because although her wounds had healed, she was still weak. Arthur then apologized for having them involved in his misfortune and showed them his status, and all saw that his fortune is two million negative. She explained that she was known as the carrier of calamity since she was born, and that she brought misfortune to everyone around her. Seiichi asked her if there was a way to break the curse, and she said there was no. And when they finally arrived at the guild, Arthur asked them what was going going on, and she said they were gathering information to find their missing friends, and her eyes were filled with tears, because there they were referring to her as a friend. Seiichi then made the speech about how she is very important to all of them, and that they care very much about her, and they all want to solve her unfortunate problem. Meanwhile, in the Kingdom of Demons, everyone was already discovering that the Black Dragon God had been defeated, and they were shocked because he was the strongest being in the army of Lord Demon, and were wondering who was powerful enough to defeat him. On the other side of the screen, Seiichi was trying to find Arthur using the stone, when from nowhere he encountered the owner of that soon and asked if she had seen Arthuria, and she said no, but then he asked whether she knew about the curse of Arthurias, and he said yes, and then she asked him to approach Arthurian. In response, our protag assured us that Arthuria is very important to him, and that he would not abandon it. After that, he ended up meeting Arthuria at the place where they had her first mission, and asked what she was doing there, but instead of answering, she asked if she was really important to him, and said that she would always be around if she needed him, but Arthuri was stunned to say anything, so she simply let him hug her. Seichi soon began to think with his little head, and smiling like a completely wrong guy, he said that it smelled good. In this, Arthuria called by her name, and he jumped as if she had read his mind. She said she was ashamed of everything, but thanked him, and thinking about how he could help Arthuria, he recalled the ring he had found in the basement, and thought that it would have the opposite effect on Arthur, for his luck was already in the negative. He put the ring on his finger, and when she asked what he was, he said that that ring would increase his luck. Suddenly, Arthuria pushed and ran away, leaving Seiichi confused with her behavior. That made him wonder what he had done wrong. He soon realized that the way he gave the ring to her looked like a marriage request, so he went after her to clear up the confusion. The next day, Seiichi seemed somewhat depressed while having breakfast with Sarah, and when she asked what had happened, he revealed that Arthuria was avoiding him. In response, Sarah told him not to worry, as she is sure that Arthuria does not hate him, and when he asked what she wanted to do during the day, she said that she wants to help in the orphanage. So Seiichi explained that he was going to go around town and gather information. After separating from Sarah, Seiichi went to the guild to ask Goosler and them if they had any information about any important avoidance that happened recently, and he asked that in the hope of finding his friends who had been sent to that world. Friends that aren't friends, right? In response to this, the leader of the guild told him that he heard of a neighboring country, which made an invocation of several heroes. All this to fight the demon lord who has just been resurrected, and besides, he knew nothing else. This is part two of Shinkanomi, but the guild leader told him to consult the royal library for more information. Having said that, Gutsley took out a map from inside his swimming trunks and handed it to Saida, and looked as if he was afraid of dying from the smell. In the Kaiser Empire, the king and his advisor were talking about the heroes they had summoned, and the king was complaining that these heroes still can't take part in real-life battles. So his advisor suggested that he enroll the heroes in a certain school of magical magic. According to the guy, they would easily 
master this school, and they would also get all the best ranks. This way, they would show all the nations their power. The king was worried that the plan would fail, but the advisor said that, as the heroes were still children, they could be easily manipulated. The king then asked how he planned to do this, and he explained that he would make the heroes wear bondage bracelets, and this would ensure that they didn't disobey him. Meanwhile, Said couldn't get any useful information from the royal library, so he went out and explored the city. He came across a young, dog-eared girl selling paintings, and when he asked how much one cost, the girl, instead of telling him the price, was surprised, because no one had ever offered to buy anything from her before. After that, with the purchase in hand, he realized he was hungry and followed the smell of food until he reached a cafe hidden in an alley. Before entering, he prayed that the place wasn't full of perverts and weirdos like the guild, and inside, he found only two people, a blonde-haired man and the barman who welcomed him. Sade devoured the food in front of him like a wild animal, and the blonde-haired man laughed at his behavior, then introduced himself as Hans. This guy's name sounded a bit oriental, and Sade found it a little strange, but he decided to follow the plot of the story. Hans then introduced him to the barman, Nordi, who is also the owner of the cafe. Meanwhile, Artoria was sitting with Adriana in her garden. As they talked, Adriana told her to admit that she was in love with Sade, and Artoria, emotional and teary-eyed, said that she wanted to let Sade love her. And back in the cafe, Nord told Seda that if a man put a ring on a woman's left finger, he was pledging his eternal love for her, and he also said that if he tried to take it off, or even tried to say it was a mistake, he would be castrate. At this point, Seda began to think, imagine how sad it would be to have his eggplant fried, and he obviously didn't want that. So Hans suggested that he marry Artoria, but Seda hesitated, and Nord thought that our hero already had another girl in mind. So Hans was straightforward in his advice, and told him to be open-minded, and start his own harem right away, and before Sade left, Norda told him to make his intentions clear and apologize if necessary. And after he left, Norda told Hans to be careful not to expose himself. Sade, meanwhile, went to the orphanage to collect Sereya and found Artoria, who was looking for him. He wanted to explain his intention in giving her a ring and apologize, but our big boy is too cowardly to open his mouth, and when he finally roused himself and tried to speak, she stopped him with a kiss. She said she knew he hadn't given her the ring because he had feelings for her, but she didn't care, because she was in love with him. And now, the Sade was torn between remaining loyal to his gorilla wife and giving in to the feelings of the troublesome Artoria. And before he could answer, Soraya appeared and said that she didn't mind sharing Sade with other people. After all, for her, it's normal to have several females gathering around strong males. She told Sade to accept Artoria, and he wasted no time in telling her that he loved her too. They kissed, and Soraya embraced them, and also gave birth to this beautiful harem. After that, the guildmaster thrust his hips in Sade's face while he was eating, and in response, Sadie said that the master could speak without putting it in his face. And continuing to communicate, the guy advised Sadie to buy a horse, since every high-ranking adventurer has to have a horse. What's more, he pulled a map out of his shorts again, so Sadie ended up buying a horse on his own. Sereya and Artoria had other things to do. When Sadie arrived at the place, the old owner asked him if he wanted a horse for the Royal Cup. He explained that this is a race around the city walls, and that due to the nature of the race, the winners end up with very expensive expensive prizes, and as he showed Sadie the collection of horses he had for the races, Sade wondered why this man was showing race horses when he didn't want to take part in this royal cup, but the guy didn't care. He continued to show his mounts to Sade until out of nowhere he came upon a violent donkey that hated everyone, and obviously the donkey started raping its owner. At that moment, Sade wondered what this donkey was saying, and so he immediately acquired the ability to understand all languages. So he understood what she was saying, so he opened his mouth and called her a loudmouth, and when she realized that Sade understood understood, she answered him, telling him to get into her enclosure, and as soon as he entered, she tried to kick him, but he dodged easily and she tried again, but he held on to her hind legs. In the end, she gave up and apologized to him, only to say that he was the person she had been waiting for all her life, someone she couldn't beat. She introduced herself as Luloon, and Sadie told the owner that he wanted to buy her. So, before they left the place, Luloon went over and kicked the man in the face one more time. After that, Luloon was very excited. After all, she's leaving the stables for the first time in her life, and everything she sees now is fascinating. Fascinating. Sade bought her food, and she asked if she could buy more after she'd finished. And as they walked through the market, Sade saw someone talking to a girl who had to have a shade. This person went over and bought a painting, and Sade went over to see what was going on. The girl recognized him immediately and thanked him for buying her a painting. And the man who was talking to her barely recognized Sade. He told her to join the charity painting competition, which will be held a month after the royal race. However, the girl said she wasn't talented enough to take part in that competition, but she was told that since Sadie had already bought her painting, that meant he had recognized her talent if he had bought some of her paintings, and he said no. And what shocked him was that Sadie had never seen his 
paintings before, so he showed him one of them. Lu Lun and Seide took a look at the terrible painting and said that it looked like a triangle, and while he was sinking in shame, Seide asked the girl who this guy was. Then the young man introduced himself as the Duke's eldest son, Berger, and then went back to begging his mother to take part in the competition, and before she could answer, the Seide told her that he was joining the Royal Cup, and he said that if she finished at the top, she should also try to take part in the painting contest. At this point, she revealed that the Royal Cup is dangerous and asked him not to be afraid. In response, he then admitted that he was afraid, but if he didn't try, he would never overcome anything. And during that conversation, it was mentioned that the prize for fifth place in the race was a gigantic fish. And as soon as Lulun heard that, she got very excited. On the day of the Royal Cup, before the start of the race, the announcer presented the prizes to be won. The prize for second place was to take photos with the captain of the Valkyries, which made the crowd scream. And the grand prize was a ticket to spend a whole day with the Valkyries. All that didn't matter to Lulun, because what she really wanted was the fifth place prize, which was a gigantic fish. Nearby, we saw his mother coming to see Seide, and she also asked him to give up the race because it was too dangerous. But like a good wise man, he gave her a speech about how everyone was afraid of the first step, and that people need someone to push them. He then told him that Saria was the one who helped him take his first step. After that, the rules were explained, and the race began. Everyone set off on their horses, except for those with useless horses who basically died because they were frightened by the sound of the pistol. Unfortunately, Lulun and Seide were falling behind, because Lulun was hungry and didn't have the energy to run. So Seide checked his pocket and found a fruit of evolution. So he went and gave it to the donkey to eat. And as the race progressed, the competitors used all sorts of tricks to stay in the lead. One of the competitors blew a horn, which caused a pack of large wolves to appear, and a large, infernal wolf blocked the way of the other participants. And just as the announcer was about to cancel the race, the Lulun came racing down the road at top speed. Seide asked her to slow down, but she said she couldn't control herself. She jumped over the other competitors and landed in the middle of the big wolves. The effect of the fruit was so strong that her landing sent them all flying in different directions. The infernal wolf tried to attack her, but it seemed that the fruit had given him strength that she didn't have, and with just one kick, she knocked him down. The other competitors were afraid to go against them and gave up the race. Lulun, on the other hand, ran to the finish line, and so they were declared the winners. Artur and Saria stood in the crowd, beaming with pride for their man. And the only person who wasn't happy about their victory was Lulun, because she wanted the fish, and Sade tried to comfort her. There they both were, when suddenly, Lulun began to glow. And it was at that moment that Artor and Saria appeared and stared open-mouthed at Lulun, who had transformed into a human. Sadie got a little excited at the sight before him, and ended up having a nosebleed as soon as she embraced him with her human body. Confused, Lulun asked her master what was going on, and Sade tried to explain it to her. Artor and Saria also approached him and asked what he was doing, but before he could explain what was happening, that it was all a misunderstanding, she punched him in the face. Seide then told her that the moon woman was actually Lu Lun, who had changed because she had eaten a fruit of evolution. Artor and Saria didn't believe him, and told him to come up with a better lie. However, Saria went over and told her that it was true, but Artor told her to stop trying to defend this useless man. So Saria had no choice but to transform into her monkey form, right in front of her. She obviously couldn't believe her eyes, and almost fainted, but instead, she told Lulun to follow her. In town, she found a clothes store, and they bought some clothes for Lulun. While they were in the store talking, two Valkyries came to take Seide away. They bound his hands with a spell and asked him to follow them. Meanwhile, in the demon realm, all the captains of the different divisions of the demon lord's army were gathered in a conference room. And while they were talking to each other, the demon lord's daughter entered. And after thanking them for having attended her summoned, she explained that she had summoned them because she wished to discuss a possible alliance with the human kingdom. The captains were shocked. They didn't want to accept this, and obviously they all asked why she wanted to make peace with the filthy humans who had always persecuted them. They reminded the girl that it was the humans who had sealed her father away, but she responded by saying that this was all the more reason for them to unite their peoples, and continuing to speak, she said that the kingdom of the Windbirds were already trying to make friends with the demons. Not only that, she received information that there is a very powerful human who defeated the dragon god, and this human is from the kingdom of the Windbirds birds, and, according to the information she has, the black dragon god was defeated by a human called Side. She also said that the two fought fairly, and that the dragon lost. Then she was reminded of the prophecy that said that if demons joined forces with humans, a great calamity would befall them all, and in response to all this, the daughter of the king of demons said that if that happened, she would give up her own head. This dirty man continued to insist on the subject, and one of the captains told him to shut up and follow his master's orders, otherwise he would be beheaded right there. Some of the other captains agreed, and also threatened
threatened him, thus making this annoying guy cower. Then he ran away, but not before saying that he would regret having joined the humans. The war between humans and demons would end, and the daughter of the demon king thanked them all. Meanwhile, alone in the throne room, that filthy guy was worried that his plans might be ruined. But he thought for a moment and then said that no one would be able to stop him and started laughing like a madman. Meanwhile, on the other side of the screen, the Valkyries took Sade to their castle, and when he asked why they had taken him there, they told him that as the winner of that horse race there, he had earned the right to spend the day with them. So they took him to the training ground, where Captain Louise and the other Valkyries were training. Sade watched them and was impressed by their skill, and what surprised him most was that even with his sixth sense, he couldn't keep up with Louise's movements. Seeing our big boy there, Louise approached him and introduced herself to Sade, before putting a sword in his hand and then telling him that they were going to do a battle drill. Meanwhile, Sade's colleagues had been teleported to a crazy magic school, and they had barely arrived there and were already challenged to a mock battle. And a girl and a former partner of Sade's, an extra, went there and refused to take part in it. Then the people who were already studying at the school tried to intimidate them, but she went over and slapped one of them, advising them to watch out for her. Then back at the training ground, Louise attacked Sade, but he dodged easily, and she was surprised. But Sade assured her that it wasn't as easy to dodge as she thought. Then she said that she would use all her strength in the next attack and launched a series of attacks at him, but he managed to dodge all of them, and just as she was about to parry her last attack, which was going to hit him, the Seda acquired new skills and easily dodged the attack and kicked the sword out of Louise's hand, causing the Valkyries present to be shocked as they couldn't believe that he had defeated their captain in a chase-on. What they didn't know was that Sade himself couldn't believe what had happened either, as his body had moved of its own accord. At this, Louise became very excited and asked if Sadie could become her master and look after her. Out of the blue, another Valkyrie asked Sadie to accompany her because she had something to tell him in another part of the castle. At that same moment, the king was getting ready to bathe, but he didn't know that an assassin was watching him through a hole in the ceiling, and returning to the Sade, the Valkyrie who led him out of the training room told him that Louise had been been without any magic or skills, but the Sade thought she was lying because he had just fought her. Then she revealed that Louise was able to recreate any swordsmanship technique she saw, and the Sade found this talent impressive, and the Valkyrie in front of him went on to say that the person who could match Louise was the Black Paladin, and before she continued talking, the knight begged Sade to become her master, and she also said that finding someone strong like him had saved her, and seeing that he was confused, she explained that because of her talent, people were afraid to befriend her, so she was alone and had no one to call friend, and Sadie could identify with her because he too had once had a sad, miserable, lonely life without any friends. So he agreed to become Louise's master, so she thanked him, and he said he wasn't sure he could teach her well, but she told him not to worry because she would simply copy everything he did. And when Louise said they should go and train, they heard a scream and ran to investigate. They saw a maid who told them that someone had attacked the king, and Louise quickly asked Seda to go back to his house, but he said he wanted to help. However, the Valkyries refused his help, but instead of doing as he was told, Sadie went there and used another of his skills to track down the culprit, and so he discovered that the murderer was only a child, and still tracking the killer's movements, he checked her statistics and discovered that her name was Olga Kalmeria, and she was only eight years old. He also learned that she had been enslaved, and when the assassin came down from the roof, Sida confronted her. She tried to kill him, but he easily caught the knives she took, and acting on reflex due to his abilities, he reacted to everything she did, and so the little girl ended up being captured. But she broke free and tried to attack him again, but Sade continued to dodge with ease. He wondered why such a small child had been forced to become an assassin. Then he tried to ask, but she didn't give him the chance, so he ended up knocking her out. Then Louise and the Valkyries came in, and when they saw the child, they asked the Sade if she was the one who attacked the king, and he said yes. Louise then summoned a Valkyrie to interrogate the girl, and Sade wasn't convinced that this Valkyrie could really do the job, but Louise assured him that she was the best, saying that she had mastered all the skills of interrogation, and on hearing this, Saidi realized that he had learned everything in this world except how to interrogate a prisoner. After that, the Saidi asked how the king was, and Louise told him that he wouldn't wake up because the knife the eight-year-old girl had used was cursed, and the curse embedded in it was eternal sleep. She said that anyone cursed with eternal sleep would never wake up, and Sade wondered if there was anything he could do to help. So he asked to be taken to the king, and in the king's room, Sade was surprised to see that the king was Hans, the man he had met in the coffee shop. There, Louise introduced Sade to the head of the magic division, who happened to be her brother. He told Sade that they had used healing magic on the wound, but they hadn't managed to remove the curse, and the Valkyries were worried because they believed they hadn't managed to save the king. So they asked Sade to help save the king, and since he has the ability to create magic, he tried to create a spell to heal the king, 
and while he tried to visualize what he wanted with the spell, Saeed's mind couldn't come up with anything useful, so all he did was tell the guy to get better. He kept repeating these words, and accidentally asked Saeed to say them out loud, at which point everyone realized that they had put the king's life in the hands of an idiot. Fortunately for the Saeed, his ability activated at that moment, and he actually created a magic that made the king better. The Saeed didn't understand a thing, but what mattered was that the magic worked. The king woke up and was surprised to see the Saeed there, and the court magician went over and told the king that the Saeed was the one who had saved him, undoing the curse that had been placed on him. The king thanked him and promised to give him a reward, but the Saeed refused, which prompted Louise to ask him to abandon his goody-goody attitude and ask for something he wants. Meanwhile, back in the Kaiser Empire, everyone was talking about the heroes. Then the king said that he had sent his new slaves to the Magic Academy so that he could intimidate the other nations. And there at the Magic Academy, most of the students were discussing the heroes, and they were discussing how the heroes are the most hated people in the whole academy. Meanwhile, on the other side of the screen, Louise went over to ask how the interrogation was going. But the girl admitted that she hadn't been able to get anything out of the eight-year-old. And after that, they started talking about how Seda had been very nice and very magical when he told the king to allow him to learn magic and fencing with the Valkyries as a reward. After all, why would a guy as strong as him, both in magic and in physical strength and skills, want to learn something from them? Meanwhile, outside the castle, in a bathhouse, were Sarah, Arturia, and Lulu. And Arturia asked if the two weren't worried about Sadie, who still hadn't returned. But they were both very calm, because Sadie is very strong. What's more, Sarah said that he could overcome anything, while Arturia was full of jealousy, imagining Sadie doing impure things with the Valkyries. At the same time, in the bathroom of the castle, King Hans told Sadie that his dream was to build a public bathroom where everyone could bathe together. All this because apparently everyone in the kingdom would be equal as long as it was light in a bathtub. Meanwhile, in the Kaiser Empire, the king was being asked why he had sent the heroes to the academy. After all, there are strong people there, and something bad could end up happening to his heroes. But the king said that he didn't care if something bad happened. Those who died would be weak, and those who survived would be strong, and that their duty was to follow him. Then the king was asked what he would do if the heroes turned against him. Then the king's advisor said that this would never happen, because he himself had turned all the heroes into slaves, and those who tried to stop being slaves would die. Just then, an arrow flew through the window, heading straight for the king, but it was stopped by the one asking questions. So he told the advisor to take care of the king while he went after the attacker, and taking the opportunity when they were alone, the king's advisor told the guy that he had heard that the demons and the king of Wimberg had formed an alliance, and he told the king that this was an insult to him since he was preparing to go to war against the demons. Then the king just laughed it off, saying that he had already sent an assassin to take care of the king of that other kingdom. And well, after waiting so long for Scythe and not seeing him, Azaria, Artoria, and Alulun finally went to her, and Artoria was itching to kick the Valkyrie's asses for taking her husband. When they got there, they were asked who they were, so they introduced themselves as Saeth's wives. Meanwhile, back in the interrogation room, the eight-year-old girl was tied up, and she was going to undergo yet another torture session. And the torture she was undergoing was quite terrible. She was being teased with the smell of food, while she felt very hungry. However, on the other side of the door, there was a person who wanted to find out what kind of torture was going on. So the door was opened, and when the person saw how horrible the torture was, the eight-year-old girl was released and was even given food to eat as much as she wanted. And when the little girl had finished her meal, everyone started talking about the bondage collar that the eight-year-old girl wears. This collar forces the wearer to obey the orders of the person who put it on him, and this collar is the reason why Auriga had attacked the king. So the question that arose at that moment was, can't they remove this collar? And the answer is no, it's impossible to remove that collar. Otherwise, Auriga will receive a punishment, which will be a shock, which will kill her instantly. And discovering this just made everyone angry and wondering who would do such a cruel thing. On the other side of the screen, in the Kaiser Empire, the king received the news that Auriga had failed and he was furious. But the suggestion he received was not to worry, as the little girl is still wearing her collar. Then the king asked if the guy was going to get her killed, and he said yes, and the king told him to do it right away. And back in the Wimbered Kingdom, the king was told that no one except the person who put the necklace on the eight-year-old girl could take it off, and also told that there was no magic spell to deal with this situation. So Seiji decided to create a spell that would remove this curse, but he couldn't visualize anything correctly, and faced with the girl's expression of pain, he promised to free her. And it was then that he had an image of freedom in his mind, and the vision of freedom he ended up having was that of Abraham Lincoln. And without meaning to, he projected him, and he appeared in the room chanting the word, free, free. And that's how the new spell of liberation, named after the deceased former president of the United States, was created to remove the curse
nurse from the Origa, and when she was told that she was now free, she started crying. Everyone was happy, and Seiji hugged her. All this while Artoria couldn't believe that someone had done something so cruel to a little girl. And despite what was happening, Luna was busy eating the leftover, because the only thing she cares about is food. Origa-chan told them that in the Kaiser Empire, the Beast Clan is being persecuted. She explained that all the adults have been taken to a concentration camp, while the children have been trained to become assassins. She had lived her whole life serving as an assassin for the Kaiser Empire, and admitted that she had already killed many people since that collar was put on her. She claimed that she only had value as an assassin and nothing more. But her hand was caught, and she was told that she could start again, and that the Kaiser Empire are actually evil for treating animal people differently. And after all that was said, Seiji cast Braba and told Origa to become his little sister. He said that although he looks weak, he's actually quite strong, and on the other side of the screen, we saw that filthy pig talking to Helios through an orb, and Kreis was asked what the demon lord's army was doing. And Kreis told him that although the demon king's daughter was changing all the plans, he still believes that his whole plan will work out fine. Hearing this, Helios was happy that his plans were working, and took the opportunity to do his part too. And after seeing these scenes, we return to the king's castle, where Sari, Arturia, and Loon are doing their own thing, until Louise comes up to them. She asked the girls to protect the king while she was away, and when Louise was asked where she was going, she told her that they had received a report from the Black Paladin that monsters were becoming more active near the border. Therefore, the Valkyries were going to help the Black Knight deal with this situation, and when the Valkyries were ready to leave, everyone went over to say goodbye, promising that they would take care of things while they were gone. And in the castle, while Seiji was lamenting how powerful and monstrous he had become, he heard Gunslow's voice. He noticed them too, and when Seiji asked what they were doing there, he explained that they were there to see the king. As they talked, Seiji wondered why a maniac who likes to get naked was going to see the king. And in the throne room, King Hans welcomed Gunslow and them, who hadn't left their strange behavior in the guild. It turns out that King Hans and all of them are already longtime friends, and with the conversation going straight, Seiji discovered that his colleagues are at an academy of magical magic. Yes, the isekai heroes are getting into a lot of trouble at a magic academy, and during the conversation, a knight came to inform them that a horde of monsters had appeared in the forest, and that they were coming towards the capital, and they were told that there were around 5,000 monsters, and among them, there were several bosses. Hans was worried, but everyone told him not to worry because he has his Valkyries and the Black Knight. But Hans told him that his strong warriors had gone to defend the border. And there at the border, Louise was surprised by the number of monsters. And to make matters worse, a large number were still coming. So Louise suggested that they use an all-out attack so that they couldn't recover from it. She then led her Valkyries into battle. And as the battle raged, she was informed that monsters had invaded the capital. And from the demon realm, that strange guy over there was giggling as he watched the chaos unfold in the human realm. And as they watched the monsters approach, Arthur admitted that in all her years as an adventurer, she had never seen so many monsters. However, Saria was excited about the opportunity to fight again, and Loon was afraid that they wouldn't be able to defend the city. If that happened, she wouldn't be able to eat the food she loves so much, which is only available in this city. And hearing this, Saith couldn't believe that this stupid bastard was thinking about food at such a critical moment. To make matters worse, Loon laughed like crazy and said she would fight for the good of all the food. And now everyone was offering to help the city. Yes, even the other weirdos from the guild were present. With everyone in high spirits, they attacked the monsters, and before Saith could join them, he was told to stay behind and just watch everything. So, we see that somehow, the guild master used the strength of his muscles to take down the monsters, while he used his power to tie some of them up, and then use his monster whip. In this guild, everyone is really crazy, because look at the crazy way they defeat the monsters. Claudia was the only normal person among them, and in all this confusion, even the Mohicans were there using a strange technique, which, according to them, came directly from their clan. Unfortunately, at this point, Scythe was forced to agree that everyone seemed pretty cool, and for Saith, this turned out to be a moment of revelation of powers, because the owner of the coffee shop was also there fighting, and King Hansa ended up revealing that the owner of the coffee shop is a former assassin. In this, we see Seiya taking down some monsters using his gorilla arm, and Artoria was using a freeze spell before killing her opponent. Loon used her powerful kicks, and the little eight-year-old girl was also helping out, and finally, the Empire's wizard got in on the action, using a spell that made it rain fire on the monsters. Despite all this combat power, the monsters kept appearing, so he used the Tornado of Chaos to sweep them away. Seeing all this going on, Seath was getting optimistic about the battle, but unfortunately another report arrived, informing him that another horde of monsters was coming. This time, a horde made up of bosses, much bigger than the previous ones. And as they watched the monsters approaching, they all noticed that this horde was full of S-level monsters. At this, Seath wondered if he could create a spell to defeat all the monsters, but his fear in creating a spell was that he would also end up eliminating his friends, and after reflecting,
reflecting on the idea, he finally came to a conclusion and revealed his ultimate spell to end it all. He imagined a spell that attacked from the top down and acted like a judgment from God. He called his new spell Judgment, but when he activated it, nothing happened. So Scythe fell to his knees in shame. Then, out of nowhere, Lady Justice raised her sword and pronounced her sentence, causing lightning to strike the world, eliminating the monsters one by one, annihilating them completely. When the light hit Gutslow and Eris, the skeletons embraced the pain, begging for more. Scythe then checked the spell's statistics and discovered that the spell targeted those he considered evil. So the monsters were eliminated, and everyone celebrated their victory. Then that little guy who was watching everything from the demon realm complained, so the law of justice also hit him with its judgment, leaving him looking like a barbecue. And now that Scythe had defeated many monsters, he received new skills, items from his deadly gestures, but he complained because he didn't need any more cheating skills these days. The king and everyone else praised Scythe and asked him to continue using his powers to defend the kingdom. And as soon as Han left the law, the girls went to meet Scythe, and Artoria asked what kind of magic he had just done. Then the eight-year-old girl also appeared and caught Scythe's eye, reminding him of his promise to stroke her head if she did well, and he went and did it. At this point, there were other people asking for a pat on the head, but Saith immediately refused. After that, Saith was asked what he would do with his life from now on, whether he would become a teacher, live the good life, be a nobleman, or something else. Saith himself didn't know what he was going to do, so an old man kept urging him to go to his magic academy, but Saith answered him, saying that he must protect his wives and even the king. Then he was told that all this could be solved if Saria enrolled as a student, and Artoria too. According to the old man, even Loon could become a student, or a martial arts instructor. Even so, Saith refused, but the girls said it was fine as long as they all stayed together. So he agreed to go to the magic school when Louise returned, and before she did, Saith decided to take each of the girls on a date. The first was Loon, and their date was in a restaurant, and the greedy git took the opportunity to eat all she could. Then he took Artoria out. Together they went to the theater and then did some shopping, and their last date was with Saria, but she asked if she could take the little eight-year-old girl with them because she felt bad about leaving her alone. The three of them went out, and together, Saith and Saria watched the little girl play with other children, and Say thanked Saria for loving a loser like him, and then told her he loved her. He tried to kiss her, but the children noticed Saria crying with emotion, and ended up calling Scythe a bad man. He tried to explain himself, but the children lost interest in what they were saying to him, and asked him to play with them. While they were playing, they all noticed something floating in the sky. There were different images, and one of them was of Mai. Yes, at that very moment, the charity painting competition was being held, and Saith and the girls went there to watch with great enthusiasm. The master of ceremonies soon introduced the participants and their paintings, so everything went very well, and the last participant was Mai, and she was very nervous when she revealed her painting, and Scythe was shocked to see that she had painted a gallant knight sitting on a horse. Only the guy wasn't on a horse, but on a donkey. She then explained that it was a painting of the man who had given her the courage to take part in the competition. She revealed that the name of this painting is Hero, because this person was in fact her hero. So she won the competition, and Scythe congratulated her on winning. And now, thanks to her great artistic abilities, she has received an invitation to study at the City of Art. So she said goodbye and left with Clay. Meanwhile, the Valkyries finally returned to the city, and Saith met them at the gate. There, Louise told her that she had heard that Saith was leaving and revealed that she wanted to go with him. But she can't. She must protect her kingdom. So she asked him to just come and visit them a few times. And back in the demon realm, that ugly, dirty, filthy guy was lying on the floor, looking depressed, when he received a call from one of the demon lord's apostles there. As they spoke, the demon lord demanded to know why they were taking so long to bring him back, and cowering like a coward, the ugly pig informed him that the apostles were scattered all over the world, trying to muster the desperation needed to sustain him. However, the demon lord claimed that this was not enough, and demanded that he be offered more despair, death, and misfortune, so that he could return. So the apostle suggested that they visit the magic academy, as it is full of skilled children, and they have the most skilled children in the world. She said that taking the lives, she said that taking the lives of these children would certainly bring great despair, and everyone agreed with that. And the next day, Saith and the girls left town to go to the academy, where their friends from the guild, along with Haihan and all the Valkyries, came to say goodbye to them. They thanked him for everything he had done and said they would be waiting for his return. And on the way to the academy, Scythe was asked if he would miss the city, and he said that he loved it and all its bizarre people, and that he would certainly come back there one day. Then, just as they were about to arrive at the academy, something fell on the roof of the carriage. Seiji looked out and saw a man dressed as a superhero, and when they asked him who he was, he introduced himself as a hero of justice and asked them to remember him. However, Seiji simply classified him as another weirdo, 